Financial, Phil. Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Better than you. You sound like you're calling me from underwater. Oh, that, well, that's my wonderful phone service. So I'm not underwater. I'm in my car, but I'm not underwater. Well, that's better now. The first sentence was a, a little bad. I mean, that, that's much better now. A, clear. A, a gurgling sound. It was a, maybe he was just well, doing some mouthwash so his breath was minty fresh when as, he did the same. As I drive through, we may run into that again. Phil, let's talk my about th- this upcoming week here and the uh, Fed jobs uh, data coming out this week, uh, pal comments and, and whatever. What do you have for us this week? Well, and, and you said it right off the bat, the main market mover or what we're going to pay most attention to is that jobs data. And it, it's not a popular statement to make, but we do need to see some type of weakness in our jobs market to make us think that the Federal Reserve may slow or change the pace of rate increases. Now, we had a little reset on that in February. February wasn't a very good month. It, was, it wasn't as bad as January was good, right? So it's still been a pretty decent year so far. But the, the jobs market is part of the sticky inflation. If we go all the way back to August and sticky inflation was mentioned by Jerome Powell, and he said we have to experience some pain. And it, it's widely thought that that pain that he was talking about was in our labor market. And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, unemployment numbers, but what it means is wage growth. And a lot of times that is accompanied, of course, by unemployment numbers. So we do need to see some softening in order for them to say, okay, maybe we need to slow down. But it's all going to lead to the CPI, PPI, and PCE, and I know people are getting tired of hearing that, but that is what's important right now. And I think that that batch of information that we'll get from March that we'll be looking back on February is going to start on March the 14th. So market movers will start to begin this week. Right now, we're just kind of range bound as we reset from what we had thought was uh, the the pace of inflation was dropping to the satisfactory point until we got those CPI, PPI, and PCE numbers last month. We a little reset a little bit. It's almost like if you're on an airplane and you run into some turbulence and you drop down a little bit, that, that's kind of where we are right now until we get to this next batch of numbers. So what's important right now, though, for this week is, of course, always fed tone in their jaw boning, and what does those uh, the jobs report look like? Because it is it is a little window into what those inflation ratings could could give us. The January jobs report showed the economy adding 517,000 payroll jobs. Economists polled by Dow Jones are expecting just 225,000 jobs added for February, though, Phil. Yes, and, and, and you remember that, that huge uh, that huge beat, which is normally good news. You know, in a vacuum, that's really good news. You want people – our unemployment numbers, by how they measure it anyway, is the lowest since, I think, 1969. So in a vacuum, that's really good thing, a really good thing. But when we're trying to battle inflation, not so much. But that was kind of our first glimpse into uh, CPI, PPI, and PCE numbers, right? So we got this uh, employment numbers like, whoa, look at that. How do we add that many jobs? And then what followed suit was inflation, although it did, it did decrease, it didn't decrease at the pace that we had thought, and our mar- markets reacted as such. Also, uh, the Monday, as you mentioned, with the factory order data being released, economists are expecting a decline of 1.8% in uh, January, according to consensus estimates from Dow Jones. That's compared to 1.8% gain in the prior reading. This is, again, a factory order data. Bill. Yeah, and those are all the things that are baked in. You know, so we go to the supply and demand of this inflation equation, and you know, as we look at employment, that is that's part of this supply issue, right? So we still have the, or I'm sorry, the demand issue, and and that demand falls on the employment side as well. But the the manufacturing data, if it's a if it's a beat, if we beat that number, could be bad things for our markets. If we miss it, it could be good things. But again, they're they're all just precursors into what um, to what the inflation numbers tell us, which of course is a precursor to what Jerome Powell will say. And you know, there's a lot of economists as well that go back. You know, they always look at past data. What happened the last time we were in this situation? And it's hard to compare because this situation was created by COVID, which was created by government spending and, and easy money supply and 
not saying that was the wrong decision. We didn't know how to react back in 2000 with how do we keep our economy going. But, you know, this is the water damage that Mitch McConnell spoke about when he's, you know, everybody had asked, you know, this government spending and is that going to, is this going to cause a problem in the future? And he just played, he basically was very blunt. He's like, yes. And I said, well, why do you do it? And his response was, you don't worry about the water damage when your house is on fire. This is still the water damage. We're still dealing with that water damage. And so we have to work through this. But when they look back in the 70s, and this is a big fear that people have. And, of course, I was just a little baby or not born yet when this stuff was happening, so I don't have personal experience from it. But they did, you know, they did these sort of things where they uh, tightened the money supply and increased rates, and then we saw a huge reduction in, in inflation, and then they stopped. They're like, okay, we, we've done it. We, you know, we, we've accomplished what we're trying to do. Let's slow down. And then inflation got way out of hand. And we hear these stories. I hear them with our clients and we're all aware of how high interest rates were and, and people that were buying homes and automobiles back then, they all have their, their, their stories of you know, 16% interest or 18% interest, and that was the norm. And also the glory stories where I can go into the bank and get a CD for 14% or what, and the, those days are gone. Well, that, that, that was because those were bad days. And, you know, even though that your, your risk-free rate of return, which is, you know, cash products, CDs and savings and so forth, your risk-free rate of return seemed really high, but it still trailed inflation, and that's always going to be the case where the, there's a buffer there between your risk-free rate of return and what inflation is. But so they, but they look back on that, and it's what happened the last time. And the last time we, we eased up, it then got out of control. So we don't want to do that again. And, you know, I, I, I use an analogy of an antibiotic because I've done this before where they give you a course of antibiotic and you start to feel better. It's like, oh, I beat this sucker. I beat this cough. I can stop. I can stop taking it now, and then it comes back stronger than ever because Phil forgot to take his antibiotic. wasn't very bright. To, forgot to didn't take his antibiotic because he, he thought it was better, and then it came back three threefold what it was before. That's what the Federal Reserve is afraid of. And now we have this sticky inflation that we have to see movement on. I think before they make any significant pauses that have decreased of course they were doing three quarters of a percent and then it went to half a percent and this last time it was at a quarter of a percent what their next move is we just don't know is it a quarter of a percent or is it going to be a half a percent that's why we're data driven you know all these little pieces of data that are insights to the inflation readings which is an insight to what the federal reserve may do and that's what's moving our markets it's extremely boring because there's nothing out there that you know right now you're not focusing so much on company earnings. You know, think about that. We get these company earnings. We normally focus almost solely on what the company earnings were. How's Amazon doing? How's Apple doing? How's Procter? We focus solely on that and then try to, you know, we'll portray how an asset class is doing or a sector is doing. But right now when we get company earnings, it's not so much their earnings that's moving the markets. It's the CEOs and their forward-looking statements and their guidance on what they think business is going to be like. And it's a really strange narrative because you may get something where especially a Bellwether company or a Caterpillar or Amazon or something like that, where you may get a the earnings were okay, they, were, they did what they were supposed to do, but the forward-looking guidance is very grim. So you may see something where, uh, where, where a rising tide or a lowering tide doesn't do the same with the ships, but – because the forward-looking statements like, well, I don't want Amazon because, of the, boy, it looks grim. But overall, they're saying, oh, yeah, but that's what we want to see. We want to see some grim or, uh, or, or lack of demand in this market because that's part of the inflation narrative. So it's really strange right now. And it's hard to look at a piece of information, whether it's company earnings or inflation, and tell whether, whether it's good or bad. You know, because in a vacuum, a lot of these things are really good. But in the inflation, in the whole grand scheme of things of inflation, some, uh, we say this a lot, a lot of times really good is really bad, and sometimes really bad is really good. The 10-year is at 3.909%. Phil, I'm reading all kind of articles that say 4% is like a psychological breaking point when it comes to the markets and such for investors. Why is that? And um, first and foremost, I guess I have to ask if you agree with that, and if so, why? Well, I, I do to a point, and, and then, you you know, you still look at this, the intrinsic value of, uh, of equity companies and how you get to that intrinsic value 
is determined by the risk-free rate of return, and they do measure that by the 10-year yield. And so if the risk-free rate of return is higher, then stock companies are going to be lower. And that's a math equation uh, that's long and drawn out, and but it's referred to as intrinsic value. The funny thing or the, or the, the funny narrative, I should say, about this intrinsic value, let's value this. And it is important. You need to be able to value your investments, but it doesn't mean that it trades at that value. It's almost like an antique car, right? Because the intrinsic value maybe of an antique car isn't very much. If you took all the parts in this, in the sum of all those parts and said, this is what it's worth. Well, that's not exactly how that antique card may sell a car on the open market. And that's kind of how stocks are. And so, but, but when we, we, we get into the uh, risk free rate of return, and how it impacts stocks, it does have an impact on it, especially growth companies, because growth companies don't pay that much in dividends, if any dividend at all, so it impacts it more. There you go, when you look at the volatility from the NASDAQ, that what had done the best during COVID was NASDAQ, and the reason for that was because of decreasing interest rates and lowering of the risk-free rate of return to growth companies rallied on top of, of course, the, the tech sector boom because we were forced into it, and those that didn't really use it on a regular basis now kind of had to use it on a regular basis. So the tech market got a double boost in last year, and then pieces of this year, although the tech market or the NASDAQ, I should say, has outperformed the other indices, but in 2022, it underperformed the other indices, and those other indices I'm talking about, the S&P and the Dow, because of its heavyweight in growth companies and that intrinsic values as we go to price stocks intrinsically, that movement of interest rates or the, the increase of interest rates does have an impact on it. Yeah. Uh, Phil, I have the impression that a lot of our mindset is uh, is locked into what we had with COVID. That was such a shock with our, I'm talking about in the economic, the financial side of things, uh, that's such a shock to the way we were doing in the past. But a lot has changed. Supply chain is now open up. I understand uh, Ford uh, is going to uh, start building several more different, different, all different types of automobiles because supply chains available our ports were clogged that's uh that has opened up our gasoline price even though they're higher than what we want to be is not nearly as high as they were unemployment it went from eight and nine percent uh down to what it is now about four percent my point is there is a lot of improvements we've made on a host of fronts but yet the rhetoric that i hear is still has a s- strong stamp of what we're hearing during COVID. Uh, again, the mentality, investment and mentality is kind of locked into where we were during the latter stages of COVID. Uh, am I off base on that? No, not at all. I mean, you nailed it. And we have changed our mindset because of COVID and how our markets performed during COVID. And those three things that you had mentioned, they, they do have different reactions or different implications to inflation. On one hand, the supply chains opened up and you know this is positive news and the bears of us in the world are oblivious sometimes to positive news but these supply chains and the impact that the car market had or has and had on inflation kind of surprised me i never really thought that it would have that much impact on overall inflation but as those supply chains open up that's being alleviated a little bit and that helps with inflation it's part of why Inflation has dropped. You know, we, let's not ignore that. It didn't drop as much as what we liked last time, but it has come down, and it has come down quite a bit. And part of that reason is, like you had mentioned, the supply chain. But on the other side of the, of the equation where we had unbelievably high, especially for a moment in time, unbelievably high unemployment rates, that didn't last, you know, too long. I think we had like 20% at one point. It was crazy. And I don't know how valid that was because a lot of those people wasn't that they couldn't find work. It was because their work had shut down and they were, you know, the, the readings of, hey, they're applying for unemployment benefits. Well, yeah, they were because they weren't allowed to work. But, and they were getting enhanced to, to do so because part of that spending package that they helped to help get our economy through it. But now that this, our, our unemployment rates are so low, that's the inflationary pressure because as a tight labor market goes, and that demand on labor, and it, it is a lack of supply, supply being human capital. We don't have enough now to fill these jobs, so therefore 
pay goes up, and everybody's got their stories. You know, everybody does. Me, and I mean, just on the street, micro examples of walking into a convenience store, walking into a fast food restaurant, and there's not enough people to work. There's not enough waiters or waitresses or people behind the counter or people to bag your groceries or, there's just, or, or check you out at the counter. There's not enough, and they're offering increased wages, trying to attract people in to do those jobs. And that is an inflationary pressure. You know, we, we use widgets. I don't even know what a widget is, but you use widgets as an example. But if we're paying more people more money to make our widgets, those widgets must be more expensive. And it doesn't matter if it's in manufacturing or in service or in travel or, what, or leisure. It doesn't really matter if you're paying the people more to do those jobs. It's going to cost more. You know, I was out of town over this weekend and the, the breakfast in hotels, I, I think it's just, it, it's weird to see how many things have changed since COVID, but I guess the, the travel industry saw, you know, these free breakfasts that we give people isn't, a, isn't an indicator to tell us how many people are going to stay at a restaurant. They don't really care. They'll pay for it. And then when you go down to pay for it, there's not enough people there to make the breakfast or to get it out and have it ready. So you, you're going to go to a volleyball tournament and you end up starving to death because everything's not ready <laughs> because they just don't have enough people. You know, someone started working a month ago and they've already quit. They didn't even give us two weeks. They just quit. They just didn't show up. And they're off to another job. That jolt report, you know, Rob likes that jolt report. And I didn't pay much attention to it until Rob brought it to my attention. But the job opening and labor turnover, and that's how it's going now. You know, but pre-COVID, you gave someone two weeks and you worked out your two weeks and gave them time to find people but now people just leave they're gone and all of a sudden you don't have an employee and your business is struggling go to a subway or, or a restaurant somewhere i'm telling you they're understaffed in order to get that staff they got to increase prices and when they increase prices that foot long sub's got to cost more eventually or and and or company profits go down all of which is going to impact the market that's a great point i paid 14 dollars for a sub this weekend and I didn't even think twice about it, so I got to my car and looked at my wife, and I said, "I just paid fourteen dollars for a sub." <laughs> well, <laughs> the yeah, hell did I just do? You know, it's all place. Yeah, Phil, and, and a lot of that is. Go ahead. Now, you're talking about a microcosm that we see day to day, and that's very real. There is another sector, though, that I find a lot more frightening, and that is our high tech industry, our Silicon Valley. They're laying off hundreds and hundreds of folks in uh, Silicon Valley that have paid a crucial role. They're actually not. I, I, I heard a deeper dive into those layoffs, okay. Bill. A, yeah. lo a lot of those are worldwide, but a lot of those are a specific position. Net-wise, they're actually adding jobs. The, they don't get publicity for when they hire 10,000 people. They just get it when they fire 5,000 people, but there's still 5,000 more working there than they're netted out. Uh what type of jobs are they hiring? Because we hear well, they're not custodial. No, we're not. They're not custodial, and I'm not. And I and I and I'm sure the custodials custodian uh, are concerned that they lose a job. Mm -hmm. But there is a but a loss of custodian does not really hurt affect me in West Virginia. Whereas a high tech industry that's developing the technology of the future could come back and impact me. And it's this group of people that I was thinking, Rob, and I could be wrong. I've not heard the mm -hmm. deeper dive that you're talking about, and I will look into it. I just heard that we were losing or laying off a sizable number of these highly skilled individuals, many of which are foreign nationals uh, that will no longer be protected and they'll be leaving the country. Uh, someone could say, let them go but but they're the the backbone because a lot of our uh technological advances so i think there's a there's there's some risk here go ahead phil i agree with both of you guys and you know on one hand bill they're, they are laying off and i'm and i'm looking at you know this the the tech market in, in particular and they are having these layoffs right so and and rob is correct as well they are having these massive layoffs and i thought that you know, at first I was like, "Well, this is this is the first sign where maybe the labor market starts to so softening." Until you realize in the overall picture, and I, I did, I wasn't aware of this, but the tech market only makes up two percent of our overall labor force. So when they're having these layoffs, then it's like, "Well, well, it doesn't really have an impact overall." You know, you're just looking at it for from an individual company standpoint. What's it mean for that individual company? But on the other point, where I agree with Rob. Some of those positions, as I understand, I don't know because I don't know the people, 
but a lot of those positions were created throughout COVID. And so as COVID came along, and they were never really thought to be, hey, this is going to be a long-term position. You're going to work here from the age of 25 until you retire at 65 or anything of that nature. It was because of the boom in business that they had had due to COVID. And now that the tech market has kind of struggled a little bit as they've kind of capped out and started to come back down as the world reopened, now we no longer need these. So while they are highly skilled because it's in technology, they were also the newest people hired, like a first first or last in, first out kind of inventory method where they had just brought them in. That's something that happens in the coal field a lot, by the way. You know, the, the, the last person the last person hired is normally the first person out. But I think that's that was the, that's been the crux of the overall tech market. And then we see the ones like Microsoft that lay off a lot of people and I think they had 7,000 layoffs or something like that. But then these are smaller or other tech markets that had just come to be, or companies, not tech markets, but tech companies that had just come to be because of, you know, the, the COVID and the demand for technology are kind of scooping these people up. Maybe not the same people, but they're scooping the employment opportunity up. And so some, some companies are adding while other companies are losing. The ones that are losing, though, are the ones that get the headlines because they're the biggest company. They're, they're the ones that kind of ring a bell with us. There's more stocks in them. You know, their capitalization's larger. But the smaller, the smaller uh, small, tech, uh, small cap companies are scooping them up but not getting the headlines. And because of their small capitalization or their small, newer companies, they, they may not be long-term jobs. You know, this is just something that's kind of a startup or it's, it's in the early stages of development. And so they're not, it's not getting the attention. The layoffs are grabbing the headlines, but the job increases on the other end on the smaller companies are not. Phil, would it be fair to say that you agree with more of what I said <laughs> than what Bill said no, absolutely, at, at the absolutely, end here? Because that's what I got you, out of that. You have you have a very filtered hearing, Rob. Uh, I think Phil agrees with me maybe maybe more. There's like a 70-30 agreement, I think, is the yeah, split there. Yeah, and uh, let me pick I'm up one. I'm going to say 50-50. I, I heard more 70-30 on my own there, Phil. I'll, I'll play that back for you. I always say I don't like to get political. I'm going to be very political right now. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do have, and I don't know why but i do have a fear for bill i'm a little bit afraid of he's in the military i have a feeling that he could probably kill me really quickly if he wanted to so <laughs> with, I'm gonna say I with, with those big guns <laughs> one thing you said uh phil uh, uh last and first out uh i'm not sure that's true all the time and the oil patch years ago is just the opposite uh they uh, to keep uh cost under control they would get rid of the more experienced people feeling they could they had a gene pool of newer folks coming to take their place that's i understand it's what happened in the tech industry as well a lot of the uh folks been around for quite a few years are the ones now that are being laid off so, so you see what happens when you try to be nice to bill he disagrees with you you should you should listen to me there's a mild rebuke of phil very you mild to me, phil. <laughs> you should, should have stayed with me stay loyal phil how do we reach you for more information today sir yeah, you can reach me at 304-263-4343 or stop by and sit with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue or right here in Martinsburg. Just remember, Phil, there's only two things in the middle of the road, yellow lines and roadkill, buddy. <laughs> You pick a lane. You got to pick a lane, brother. No, you don't, Phil. Drive down the middle. Close your eyes and drive down the middle. You got to pick a lane, my brother. Always fun, Phil. Always fun. Have a great day. Bye bye.